May God bless the reading of the Holy Scripture on this day. So how many of you have ever been uh, angry before? I'm going to invite you to uh, get together with somebody you know and tell about some time you were angry in this past year. Tell about some time you were angry in this past year. If you don't want to do that because you're angry at me for asking you, um, that's okay. I invite you to just stay where you are. The best thing to do if anyone comes to you is if you um, pray, then they'll leave you alone. And I mean that sincerely. If you don't want to participate, that's fine. But I'm going to invite you to get together with one or two other people. you got a couple minutes. Tell about a time you were angry in this past year. Go. You got about a minute left. So you're all set up. All right, so anger. It's one of those emotions that um, when we were growing up that we were called to keep under control, right? Well, the Bible says for us to keep our anger under wraps as to our, not under wraps necessarily, but under control. And uh, I remember as a kid that uh, if, if you were showing anger, usually mom or dad would tell you to, in essence, calm down. They used some other words where I came up, but um, calm down. And then I also know that it wasn't good to show anger to your parents, that you are showing anger to them because um, in our household then you might meet what we call a wooden spoon so um, so th that we remembered that if you were going to show anger the best thing for you to do is just try to keep it under wrap and keep it going and see what you could do someplace else to vent that anger out and a lot of folks have understood that anger uh, as a Christian that we aren't ever to be angry well there are plenty of instances uh, where there is that emotion is given to us by God. It's what we do with that emotion that, that we have some trouble with. But let's look, though, at Jesus. So what you need to know about um, Jesus in this particular passage of Scripture. So here we are in the book of Matthew. By the way, how many of you are reading through the book of Matthew during the month of January? Some of you are? Great. If you haven't been, um, I would invite you to start at least this week. I don't want you to go necessarily back through the whole thing. But start this week, because this is the week that we are going to start Jesus' final week on earth during his earthly ministry. So uh, in, the, in the Christian church, when we begin that earthly ministry, his final week, it happens in the, with, on the church, in the church calendar, on a Sunday um, that we call Palm Sunday. All, all of you familiar with Palm Sunday? The answer is yes. Very good. Um, Palm Sunday. Remember, Jesus is coming from... Uh, coming into town from Jerusalem, he is riding a donkey, uh, which is a prophecy that he's fulfilling. And, uh, and he is coming from, well, he's coming from the south, but, but we know that he is from Galilee. Right? Now, Galilee has, is the northern part of Israel, and Judea is the southern part of Israel. Now, this is only important for us because you, you need to get a sense of what's going on in some of the minds of some of the folks there. So here's how it helps me. 
Um, I, I, I've even heard this here. So uh, you were told by some people to cut me some slack because I'm from a little town, right? Uh, don't. Randy's from a little town, give him some time, you know, it takes a while to acclimate to the big city, and, and along with that comes some kind of, um, uh, some baggage with that. Now, yes, I'm from a little town, but one of the littlest towns that I ever been a part of is when early on in my ministry, we had a three-point charge, and one of them was a town called Tenney. Anyone here lived in Tenney before? No? Some? Tenney is population four. Population four, and the church that I um, was the pastor of had four people in the pews. Um, two of them named Catherine, and two of the people were named Al. They all had their own pew, and um, all, although we got them to sit all on one side, but they all had their own pew, and uh, Tenny, when I first started, it was in, it started in February, and they don't plow the road in Tenny, so um, we met at one of the Catherine's house. And at that house, there were four of us, five of us gathered. Well, um, there are a few more because Catherine brought his, her husband around the table um, and Sandy was there and our two kids were there too. So we were gathered around a kitchen table and Al and Al during the sermon would talk back to each other. And they would fumble through the hymnals and all those things. Not much unlike what you all do during the sermon now. Um, I we do have cameras in here so i just want to let you know now if i would talk to some of the people who were from the bigger town where we lived which was norcross that that was 85 people including all the cats and dogs and talk about tenny they even had some things to say about well who would ever live in tenny minnesota i mean four people come on and then you know these people are living in a town of 85 people so i want you to it might be helpful for you to think about, uh, of, so we're in Coon Rapids, or most of you are from Coon Rapids. Even our guests are coming from Coon Rapids today. So uh, Coon Rapids or Andover or Spring Lake Park or somewhere around there, Anoka. Somewhere. So I want you to think about here, and I want you to think about, is there any differences about here and say, um, say Edina? So if you would go to Edina, and you somehow um, let people know that you are from Coon Rapids or from this area, would they embrace you with open arms and think that there's nothing different about the two of us? No. Somebody said no. And some of you are wisely saying, do not say anything. It's a trap. <laughs> well, the same is true. So, so folks who live in the Twin Cities, because I've lived in, quote, greater Minnesota, for, uh, well, now most of my life. So uh, there is something about people who live in the Twin Cities versus those who live in greater Minnesota. If you live in greater Minnesota, you have some idea of uh, what a city person would be like. And, and I know that living here, we don't understand ourselves necessarily be city people. But if you live in greater Minnesota, we are. And there's this, this feeling whether it's real or not, it doesn't make any difference. It's still there. And that's what's going on here. So Jesus is from a town called Nazareth. And in the scripture, it says, what good could ever come out of Nazareth? It's from the north. And Jesus is coming to the southern kingdom in Judea, where the big city is Jerusalem. And you need to know that it's, it's Passover. So all kinds of people are, are con converging on Jerusalem, including all kinds of people from the north. And they are coming to worship God, just as well as the people from the south. However, the people from the south have some um, ideas of what the northern people are like, and they aren't all that happy with them. In fact, if you were from, especially from the region of Galilee, Galilee Galileans had a certain way of speaking and, that, and pretty much anybody could tell whether or not you were from Galilee just by the way you spoke. So when we get, when Jesus comes into the city, it's important for you to read that. I invite you to read all, uh, start with chapter 21 and read all the way through 21 through the end of the, end of the book of Matthew, which is chapter 28. And um, you'll find that they are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the, to the Messiah, to the Son of God, uh, from Jesus of Nazareth. So they're wanting all the folks to know that this Jesus is from Nazareth. 
And the people in the south are going, that can't be. There's no Messiah that would on earth come from someplace like that. So the northerners are all saying, yep, we have, our, we have the king, and the king is from Nazareth. And the Judeans are going, there is no way that this could ever happen. So here we are, Palm Sunday, and Jesus is coming into town. Now, he's riding on that donkey. Everybody, a bunch of folks are putting down the, their cloaks and their, their palm branches and so forth. And they're coming into town. And then uh, Passover week is, it, it's kind of like Super Bowl week. All right, maybe not. Um, <clears throat> but let's pretend that, so Super Bowl week would be like, you get to go to all these parties, everything is going on, you're trying to decide, how many of you are going to a Super Bowl party on next, next Sunday or are going to host one? Nobody here. All right. Uh, I don't even like football, and I'm already thinking about what we're going to have. <laughs> you know, the game is one thing, but the advertisements, those are kind of cool. So in any case, so... So this is what's, it's, it's a hub, it's, it's fun, everybody's coming into town, you get to meet up with your, your old friends from all over, your family from all over, and so the, the temple itself has this big, these big courtyards, and the big, biggest courtyard is where anybody can come. And inside those courtyards you'd find um, teachers with some of their disciples, so rabbis with some of their students, and they're trying to te teach about that, and there'd be some over here, and there's a hubbub, it's, it's fun, you can go get your cheese curds, you can get all that kind of stuff. Well, maybe not cheese curds quite yet. So, so this is going on, and Jesus is there in the midst of this. And he sees that there's something going on within the temple that he is boiling about boiling here's what's going on so when you come to passover one of the things that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to bring a sacrifice in order for you to be part of the worship service so if you are of better means you probably are bringing a lamb or buying a lamb or uh, if you're if you're really of good means you can buy an ox or a cattle or something like that but if you are of lesser means you're going to bring in pigeons or doves in order for them to be sacrificed so that you could be part of the worship service. And in order, and this is what the priest, now, now th all those things are prescribed in the, in the Hebrew text, in the Old Testament. So the, the different kinds of sacrifices are there for people to be a part of. But what's not prescribed in the Old Testament is this. Now the priests are trying to raise money for the church. It doesn't happen anymore, so don't worry. Don't, I'm not getting your, your, your wallets yet. Um, but what they're trying to do, they were trying to raise some money for the church. And so they came up with this great idea that, well, as long as people are making these long treks here from who knows where, we should offer them our own sacrifices to sell. So we'll, we will have farmers do all those kinds of things for us. We will um, then sanctify. We'll say, oh, this is kosher. And the other thing that they're going to do is, well, in order for people to buy our special sacrifices, they, we need them to exchange their money into temple currency. So, because we don't want money from, well, we don't want money from Galilee, I can tell you that. So, we want money that's just for the temple. And so, if you wanted to, to buy anything within the temple, you had to go and um, basically change your money out into temple currency. It's kind of like... Have you all gone to a fair before where there are tickets for everything? And they won't take your money. They said that it costs like three tickets or four tickets. And so you go and buy a book of tickets, and then at the very end you're going, I have this one stupid or two stupid tickets left, and what can I get for two tickets? And you go ask somebody, they say, oh, we don't have anything for two tickets. You better buy another ten. Right? See, that's, that's, it's the same thing that's going on here. And that's precluding stopping some of the people from being able to participate because they simply don't have money now if you're from the north you're probably thinking okay well one thing i could do is we, we raise a lot of doves up here i think what i'll do is i'll bring our own doves and bring them forward to be sacrificed well in order for them to do that it's perfectly fine for them to do that but they have to have them approved by a priest now if you are a priest sitting at a table and your job is to make sure that 
all the, I mean, yes, it's to worship God, but the other thing is, all right, they're bringing me their own doves, and I have doves that we need to sell. So they look at their doves and say, oh, did you see this? There's a, there's a little feather out of place here. These aren't acceptable. You'll have to buy ours. And if you just step over there, you can exchange your own currency for the te proper current temple currency. Next. That's what's going on here in the temple. And Jesus is furious. He is so mad that he looks at those people who are taking the money and he gets up and he throws the tables over. Money is flying everywhere. The doves and the pigeons, they're flying everywhere. I don't know what happens to the lamb and the cattle. They probably are kept outside for a while anyway before someone can bring them in. And the place is chaos. And I can just see the southerners saying, well, that figures he's from Nazareth. I want you to think about the birds for a moment. Now, when we first see birds in the Bible, um, we're going to find them at creation, right? God creates all the things, including birds. But I want you to think of a story within the Bible where uh, we, we single out some birds. Still in the book of Genesis. And we're going to have a, a time when there's 40 days of, of rain and 40 nights of rain. And who is, who's, what's, what's this story? Noah, very good. So Noah, and remember after the 40 days and 40 nights of rain, the rain has subsided. And so we're still floating on the ark. Now, in order to find out whether or not, how soon we're going to be, uh, be able to dock, basically, what, Noah sends out a, an, a bird. The first bird that he sends out is a raven. And does the raven come back? No, the raven doesn't come back. So he sends out another one, and finally we get to a dove. And when the dove comes back, what does the dove have in its beak? An olive branch. It doesn't say that in the scripture, by the way, but it does say that there's a branch. He brings back, and, and then we know, it, we don't dock yet, but we know that it, we're getting closer to being able to get onto dry land. But when, you, when we hear about that dove coming back with that branch in its beak, we think about life. That life is going on outside of the flood, and that life is being promised to us. So that dove is bringing a sign of life. Now, we're going to go to, um, to the book of Leviticus. And the book of Leviticus is where you're going to find some of the sacrificial pieces. And you're going to find some of the things about doves in there, doves and pigeons. And, uh, and now we're going to go to the New Testament. We're going to go to the Gospels. Now, Jesus has been born, and, uh, and, and they are living in Bethlehem at this time, and so they're waiting for the time of Jesus' circumcision. And uh, so they go to Jerusalem for the circumcision. Mary and Joseph are not of means, and so in order for... Um, uh, Mary needs to be, have purification rites done, in order for her to have purification rights, which just means that she needs to become holy. She needs to be sanctified. So in order for that, she needs to give a sacrifice on her behalf so that she can become holy, so that she can participate and, and present Jesus to be circumcised. So what she needs to bring is because they don't have a lot of money, they can bring either two pigeons, two doves, or a pigeon and a dove. We don't know what they bring. It doesn't say in Scripture. We just know that that's what they bring. But they are then sacrificed, which means that instead of something else happening, the birds are taking the place of, of, of sin. So the priests take that sacrifice, and then, and then Mary becomes, and Joseph, for all that, and they become holy enough to enter into this presence and to participate in the, sec, in the circumcision of their son, Jesus. Now, I want you to think about sacrifice for a moment because it's pretty important. So this bird is basically taking the place of our, of, of our own sinful being, and it's dying on our behalf. That's what the sacrificial piece is. Now, we're going to go when he's older, he meaning Jesus. We're going when he's 30 years 
He is in the north again. We're, we're in Nazareth. We're in Galilee, in the region of Galilee. And we're going to go to the Jordan River. At the Jordan River is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is baptizing all these folks, and all of a sudden Jesus comes in, and Jesus wants to be baptized, right? You've heard this story before? I'm losing my... Yes? Oh, good. So what happens when Jesus is baptized by John? A dove comes down. It says, a dove descends. And, and God says from the clouds, this is my son, with him I am well pleased. But a dove descends. So this dove is, is indicating to us that, well, we see it as the Holy Spirit. This, the Spirit is descending like a dove and comes to be around Jesus. And so we see this as a sign, as a symbol, as that this is our king. This is the Messiah. It also helps that, that God voices that as well, but there we have. So we, we have a dove who's becoming a sign for us. And now let's fast forward to Jesus here in the temple. When he overturns the tables and the, the coins are scattering, I want you to pay attention to what, what likely happened to those doves. Well, first of all, let's check out. Has anyone ever had birds before as pets? Some, let me ask you a different. Does anyone currently have a bird as a pet? How many of you used to have birds as pets? Why did you stop? They're noisy. They're messy. And what's? They're annoying. They're, I, I'm going to um, rest with messy for a moment because I don't know of a bird who hasn't had too much milk of magnesia for whatever reason. They are really messy. And I contend that, that hold that in your mind about how grace works as well. So here we are. And Jesus is overturning the tables. And the doves leave i mean what happens when when there's being sold is they're probably in cages or um, or baskets of some sort and when jesus overturns the tables and the benches i can tell you what they're gonna they're gonna be gone and they fly away now that's not in the pages of scripture i'm i'm uh pushing that in there to for us to kind of think about but i want you to think about that dove who's getting away you see if the sacrifice is for us to become holy and this dove somehow escapes, we still have to find some way for us to become holy to enter into God's presence. Now, some of you are going, well, why? Wait, 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 wait. What's going on with this whole thing? We know that God is holy. How do we get holy? And why do we have to be holy? So I want you to imagine for a moment, if you would, a, uh, a basin of water, big, and um, what, what's gone into the water is it's not just Brita water, it's that other, what's the other one that's five times as good as Brita? Anyone else? Whatever it is. So, so it's 100% pure. My question is this to you. So we have this big thing of water, and we have a, one tiny, one tiny little droplet of, of mud water, just one. And here's this big thing of water. Now, if I put one tiny little droplet of mud water into, the, into this water that's 100% pure, is this water 100% pure any longer? No. It's dirty. Would I still drink it? Well, especially if I was thirsty, I'd still drink it. But it's not pure anymore. God is pure. Therefore, if, if, if anything comes to God that doesn't have that same holiness, it would make God impure. It would, make him, it would make him unholy. So that can't go on. So there has to be a way for us to get close to God to be pure and holy. And when Jesus comes, he makes a way for us to 
be pure. When those doves fly away, when that sacrifice leaves, there's just the lamb who's left. And if you're reading through the book of Matthew, especially this last week, you're going to hear more about that lamb of God. You see, we have to have some way of being able to get close to God. And Jesus says, I'm going to make that way for you. When he is up on that cross, there's no need for doves to be our sacrifice or, or lambs or cattle. Jesus becomes our sacrifice. And as a free gift to us, he offers us a way to become holy and pure so that we can be close to God. You see, God, Jesus is always interested in us becoming close to him. So interested that he'd go through anything, literally anything. His love is so wide and deep that he calls us my prayer that you as you read through that last those last chapters of the book of Matthew that you are renewed once again in knowing how deep the love of God is for us let's pray gracious father we just thank you for for loving us with such capacity that there is nothing that we could do on our own that would ever ever get us to be good enough And you gave up so that we could be. May we never take your grace for granted. We pray these things in your name.